the talk is, is really about um, how the notion of big data is kind of changing our, our methodology and how really our methodologies are, are conforming to the data and whether or not that's actually a worrying thing. And I'm going to talk about two examples, and one is from um, econophysics and the and physics of financial markets, and the other is, is from the LHC. And I want to specifically focus there on the issue of validation, and because it's very important in, um, in looking and in doing uncertainty quantifications and, and, and just validation in general for the simulations that are run but how, in fact, the LHC valid validations are rather different from the methodology of verification and validation as it was originally established by people in uh, computational fluid dynamics. And it's employed specifically in lots of different places like NASA. And, um, and, and, but th that notion of validation there in the context of simulation is, is, is rather different than the way that validation is, is looked at uh, or carried out at the LHC. Okay, so um, I want to talk just very briefly in, in the beginning about what actually big data is, then we'll get the example of financial markets, uh, and then the LHC example, and then some conclusions. Um, and the conclusion is re conclusions are really in the form of a question, so I'm kind of interested in discussing um, of this issue about the relationship between methodology and, and big data and whether or not people think of this as a, as a philosophical problem or indeed an empirical problem for data uh, validation. Okay, so um, big data is kind of a relative notion. Um, let's big in one context is not always big in another, um, but mostly it refers to the uh, exponential growth and availability of data. But it's really about, largely about our computational powers for handling uh, large amounts of data and our ability to manipulate that data in ways that make it informative for us. So really the goal um, in using big data is to identify, or one of the main goals at least, is to identify patterns in the data and then see what those patterns are telling us. So there's been a lot of, I think, kind of crazy claims made about big data. Um, one is this very famous one by Anderson and Wired that says, well, the data, the data deluge is making the scientific method obsolete. And, um, kind of crazy. Um, then you, there are other remarks like um, data and applied mathematics is just going to replace everything. There's not going to be any need for what we normally think of as, as sort of methods of empirical investigation. And then others is, well, if you've got enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, that you, know, you don't need any kind of theory. Just you can read things off the data if you've got enough of it. Um, so what is a big data? Well, Walmart, for example, um, they process something like uh, more than a million customer transactions per hour. But of course, that data is very small compared to the kind of data that you get at the LHC, where you've got 150 million detect, uh, sensors, uh, 600 million collisions per second. But of those, you only save about 100. Um, collisions per second that are of interest. So you're dealing with lots and lots of data here. Um, and so the annual flow from all of the four experiments is about 25. Um, but of course, if you incorporated all of the data that's produced, then it would actually be impossible to work with. So um, you need some way of actually handling all of that data. So how do you process this in a way that's going to make it um, usable and informative? Um, so the pattern recognition um, that is used, or the, the methods that are used for pattern recognition, are going to be obviously different in very different fields. So the, when you're looking at this from a philosophical perspective, what you need to look at is not just the bigness of the data, but also um, how you validate these processing methods um, and the legitimation of those methods. So as I said, I'm going to look at two examples. One is from um, Econophysics and uh, the other from the LHC. 
two uh, particular issues related to each of these cases. In the econophysics case, you find that the, the way of dealing with big data in, in financial markets brings with it a lot of unwarranted, well, economists like to say unwarranted assumptions about, or lack of assumptions about the nature of the underlying economy that made perhaps the data, uh, the methodology for uh, uh, handling the data rather suspicious. In the LHC case, I think one of the important questions is how to validate the simulations. This is very important because a lot of the data um, comes from simulation and indeed relies on simulations. And we, we saw this morning um, and in several of the talks about the role of simulation and how important it is um, in the overall experimental context. So let me start first with the, um, the econophysics example. So what actually is econophysics? Um, well, it's really the, stu the dynamical study of uh, economic systems that borrow techniques from physics. So the history of this goes back to um, when uh, traditional models of, of uh, pricing were usually uh, based on uh, Gaussian distributions and, and random walks. Um, and what happens in, the, in that kind of modeling is that um, the negligible effects from large deviations are really are exponentially screened in, in the Gaussian uh, distributions. So, and the Gaussian distribution, of course, has a, has a very important property in that um, it tails off very rapidly. So what happens is that um, the probability of large fluctuations occurring becomes very, very low. So, um, Back in the 60s, um, Mandelbrot and uh, Fermi showed that, in fact, markets didn't really obey this kind, didn't really have this kind of Gaussian character, that they were more accurately described using power laws, um, and that the markets really exhibited a kind of self-similarity um, in the behavior of commodities over um, a lot of different time scales. Now, so these power laws, are, they're superficially similar to bell curves or to Gaussians, um, but the tails are very different. So the regions that cover these large fluctuations look very different in power law curves than in Gaussian curves. Um, and you get big market jumps, or big jumps in the market are, are much more common in power law systems. Um, and that's what gives rise to these fat tails. So, the fat tail tendency here, the fat tail is a reference uh, to the tendency of uh, assets prone to price jumps. Um, there are more observations of those in the fat tails. So the tails are described using a particular parameter, and statistical theory suggests that if the value of that parameter is greater than three, then the system is not really random. So the Gaussian, of course, is based on the idea of a random walk. So we assume that there's a, a sort of essential randomness going on here. But if, if the systems actually obey these, uh, are, are better described using power laws, then uh, for values of the, fa of the tails greater than three, there's a suggestion that the randomness doesn't actually exist. And um, Magenta and Stanley, in a very famous paper in Nature in 1995, um, used what they called then big data. Um, used, they used about five million data points and looked at fat tail returns for periods of up to one minute, from one minute up to four days. And they found that the, the parameter describing the tail was actually four for the S&P index and for lots of, of other companies on the New York Stock Exchange. So, we have here just a sort of normal uh, picture of, the, of what a fat tail distribution looks like versus a normal distribution. And you see here that the normal one tails off, whereas the fat one. Um, so you've got a lot of stuff going on here underneath the tails, a lot of uh, uh, price fluctuations that get damped out in the Gaussian distribution, but it, of course in the power law description, 
Um, there's a lot of stuff still going on there. So um, the other thing that became very important, so you have this description of the market using power laws is one thing. The other thing that became very important for uh, looking at finance models in financial markets was that increased uh, computer power and increased speed and uh, range of the transactions also allowed for a lot of increased fluctuations in the market and an amplification of those fluctuations. So financial houses and people were accumulating all of this data and um, so economies and markets tend to start to start looking at each other more because of this availability of lots and lots of data. So you got in this data lots of non-trivial couplings and non-linearities and so you got systems that um, were in fact um, uh, very um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, chaotic, I'll say, but that wasn't the word I was thinking of. Um, so the problem then is how to deal with all of these nonlinearities, right? Um, and if you try to simplify uh, the underlying nonlinearity, where you can get a model that's actually sort of tractable, um, then what happens is that you can suppress some of these important effects that are going to have very large effects on the, on the model in general, or indeed on the, the market that you're modeling. So the, the way that uh, was typically, the model that was typically used for this kind of thing was the, the famous Black Skulls model. Um, and that, what the, the Black Skulls model did was uh, constructed in the 70s, they won a, um, won a Nobel Prize for it in the late, in the 90s. Uh, the idea was you could calculate the future of a derivative uh, by taking averages in an assumed statistical market environment. So the fluctuations and correlations that could exist, in other words, the stuff that comes under the fat tail, um, was actually ignored. And so the black skulls model is really based on a kind of Gaussian distribution, a, a normal statistical averaging. So what happens, you get, you get crashes. And so the 2008 crash was largely, in, in many circles, thought to be the result of, of using this kind of black skulls model, which typically ignores the, the fat tails of a, a, in, a, in a power law distribution. So the question is then, how do you deal with these fat tails? because black schools doesn't seem to be the answer. Well, if you look at physics, very often um, power laws are usually seen in systems where there's a principle of universality. And what that means is that you get systems that look very differently, or very different in their microscopic constitution. So systems like liquids and magnets that behave exactly the same way at critical points. So they have the same critical exponents, and they belong to uh, the same universality class. Of course, in statistical physics, um, these kinds of, of uh, calculations and the calculations of critical indices um, and universality takes place in phase transitions in systems that are um, at or close to the thermodynamic limit. So, infinite systems potentially, or at least 10 to the 23. Um, so very, very big systems. Um, and the idea here is that the systems that belong to the same universality class, um, their behavior at critical point is insensitive to the underlying microscopic uh, constitution. So their behavior uh, is, is a function simply of, say, the symmetry and dimensionality of the system. So, um, and the method for handling this kind of thing, the method for explaining um, the occurrence of universality in, in these systems is typically the, the renormalization group. Um, and renormalization group techniques were developed as a response to inadequacies of uh, mean field theory. And mean field theory 
is really, again, a process of averaging um, where you reduce a kind of a multi-body problem to an effective one-body problem. But of course, the, the problem with mean field theory um, is the same as the problem with the black skulls model. Um, and the black skulls model takes its sort of methodology from mean field theory. The idea is that you do these statistical averagings, but in fact, in systems that, di di that display power law behavior, like these universality classes and like the financial markets, you get um, <coughs> a, a, a problem with, uh, with mean field theory because the statistical averaging doesn't give you the right results. So prior to the introduction of remoralization group methods in the 70s, um, nobody could really explain this basis of universality. I mean, people knew it existed. They knew that liquids and magnets behaved in roughly in the same way, but nobody could understand why because they weren't allowed, they weren't able to calculate critical indices and see that in fact they, they had the indices had the same value, the same fixed points. So renormalization group then was a, a way of handling these kinds of, of very large systems that have lots and lots of fluctuations. Um, and what it does is it enables you to get rid of the uh, irrelevant parameters without just assuming uh, a kind of statistical averaging. So it, the, the idea is you start with a lattice and apply a kind of, there are different, uh, uh, different <coughs> renormalization group methods. There's real space methods, mo momentum space methods. But the idea is that you apply the transformation over and over again and you, um, you, through a process of iteration, you get, gradually get rid of the irrelevant parameters um, for the, the, the effect that you want to explain. And so um, the microphysics, in some sense, gets absorbed into the, into the macro parameters. So you can extract this sort of universal behavior from the uh, from the, the application of the transformations. Now, so the idea then is that you apply this kind, you can apply this kind of technique to financial markets. And that's what a, a lot of, of what goes on in econophysics because the financial markets seem to have the same kind of fluctuations as systems and statistical physics. Um, but the problem is that in applying these kinds of method, this kind of methodology, um, there are no assumptions about human behavior, about the structure of the markets, and the methodology assumes that you're dealing with agents of zero intelligence. So there are no assumptions made about how human psychology enters into trading in financial markets. So it leaves out a lot of what the you would typically take to be economic variables. All that, that um, people who work in this field are interested in is whether or not there are patterns in the data. Um, so, and the assumption is that uh, many of the precise details at the microscopic level, that is details about the nature of the market, the kinds of things that are traded, and indeed about the psychology of the traders, um, or the psychology of the, the market agents, um, are just simply not relevant to the large-scale properties that define uh, uh, the market, the fluctuating market. Um, so, what are the gains in something like this? Because you want to say, well, look, I mean, if you can't take account of all of the things that we normally <coughs> take account of when we're thinking about economic systems and markets, then well, what's the point of this? How, is this? how is this giving us any information? Well, the idea is that you can spot certain kinds of structural features that are related to markets that are inherent in this market data. And some of these structural features involve, for example, the probability of large price movements and the idea that those price movements actually decrease um, in accordance with an inverse cube power law in lots of different kinds of markets. So you can look over a number of, of very different sorts of markets and you find this same kind of relationship. Uh, another uh, 
uh, instance of this is that in large crashes, the aftermath of a large crash, um, you get a lingering activity in uh, the market, uh, in the description of the market that uh, follows um, the Amori law for the kinds of shocks that you get after an earthquake. So you can predict um, using uh, these techniques certain kinds of large structural features um, about how the market is going to behave. But that comes as many economists feel is uh, really not a very good explanation of what's going on. And they want to say that this isn't really a legitimate way. Okay, it's a way of handling all of this big economic, big data that's related to financial markets, but it's not really a very efficient way of thinking about what's going on in these markets. Why? Because, well, laws, the laws of the economy change all the time. The laws of physics don't change. Um, uh, the material agents aren't passive at all, they have intentions, they have goals, and surely all of that has some relevance to the way we describe the market fluctuations. Um, and the answer, of course, is just, again, no, well, what we're interested in is these uh, large-scale structural assumptions, patterns in the data, and that's what's really going to inform us about how markets in general move and uh, uh, react to certain kinds of things. So there's a sort of debate in economics um, about these kinds of methods that come from econophysics and say, well, um, okay, maybe that's the sort of thing you have to use to describe uh, the, the enormous amount of data that we have. Uh, from financial markets, but really those kinds of methodologies aren't really aren't very uh, informative when it comes to dealing with real world situations, whatever uh, economists mean by real world. Um, okay, so that the obvious challenge then of, of working with big data, especially in this case, is that um, the volume can very quickly exceed what you can actually compute, what's feasible to compute. And lots of methods fail to, to scale up to that volume of data. And so, you know, mean field theory, the black skull model, black skulls model, there was no way to scale those models up because they were just built on uh, assumptions that were no longer relevant when you took into account systems with very, very large numbers of, of uh, molecules or a, a large number of uh, 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 a very large amounts of data. So, um, so you need new methods in order to do this, but along with the new methods come other kinds of assumptions that may or may not be welcome in terms of underlying explanations. Okay, so what about um, the LHC data? Um, that's very heavily, we saw that there's enormous amounts of that. It's very heavily reliant on simulation. So there's two issues here, I think, that are um, important. One is dealing with the bigness of the data, and that um, is related to the, uh, to the triggers, and um, some of the talks already today uh, discussed the role of, of triggers in, in processing that data, figuring out what to save, what to throw away. Um, and then second is ensuring that the data is reliable when the source of a lot of that data is actually simulation. So it's different from actually gathering data in the field, um, as it were, when you have, for example, data from financial markets. Um, here you've got simulated data. So how do you ensure that that, that, that data is reliable? Never mind how large it is. Um, so here we've also got, um, we're interested in, in pattern recognition. Um, again, we've got these lots and lots of, of data. Um, you need that much data to create enough chances that um, a rare particle or dark matter or whatever you're interested in is going to be created. But you also need that much data to establish a, a five sigma result. Um, so what you're interested in here is a, a, a p-value. 
Um, and uh, the idea is that you, it's the probability of observing something, an extreme result, um, if there weren't really anything going on, if there, was, if there was actually nothing there. So the five sigma then is a, a one in, in three million five hundred thousand chance that um, you'd see that bump if there was nothing there. So, um, so the bigness, as I said, the bigness of the data, um, we've got, uh, they've got a, a, a trigger system that actually is designed to collect about 200 um, interesting events per second. And there's three different trigger levels. I'm not going to go through this because most of the people here um, know much more about this than I do, and also most of the paper, a lot of the papers already mentioned this. So you've got three different levels of triggers, each doing very different things, but um, ruling out um, data that's uh, that um, that's not usable or that's not interesting, and then finally you get um, from level three data that gets stored offline for further analysis, um, and then that data is is uh, further processed. So the idea here is that the, the entire framework um, of the experimental operation is, is really very much grounded in simulation knowledge. Um, the measurements at the LSC, at the LHC rather depend not just on simulation for data or event production and processing, but for design and operation of the detectors, knowing what the data mean, knowing what to look for, knowing where to look for it, um, and we saw some of the pictures this morning about, you know, this is what a, a Higgs event might look like. Um, you need, all of those things need to be simulated um, in order to be able to um, understand what the, the signal data um, are when they're uh, being produced. So you've got, again, uh, a number of different kinds of simulations. You've got event generators, uh, decay packages, You've got various kinds of detector simulations um, and detector responses. Um, lots of general purpose event simulations um, and also um, different requirements that have to be met in the detector so that you don't get pileups of particles in particular areas of the detector. Um, simulation to make sure the detector is radiation resistant. Um, and so simulation provides the basis for all of this knowledge um, in the design, the operation, um, as I said, knowing what to look for and knowing where to look. Um, also being able to distinguish between different types of particle production. Um, you need very accurate simulations to get jet numbers and, and energy variables um, exactly right. Otherwise, um, you're not going to be able to determine um, uh, hard jets from uh, extra decay jets. So the question then, if, if you want to think about this in a more philosophical way, is, well, you know, why should I trust all of this? I mean, why should we think that simulation is giving us the right answers here? Because there are so many levels um, of, of sort of uh, analysis that, that goes into these experiments, um, and you've got different levels of simulation. So why should we trust all of this? Well, the there's an ongoing. <laughs> that was the answer. I think. <laughs> There's an ongoing simulation uh, validation project at the LSE. It's at LHC rather. It's a big part of the overall uh, experimental uh, uh, project, um, and it really is dedicated just to addressing the this issue about the validation of, of the simulations. It's based on, or it derives from at least, um, a, a well, fairly well-developed methodology of verification and validation that was designed for uh, validating simulations in uh, uh, NASA, from the U.S. Department of Energy, storing nuclear waste, that sort of thing. And millions and millions of dollars have been put into uh, looking at um, 
the right sort of methods for verification and validation, both by the US government and various other sort of agencies. Um, so the question then is, well, okay, what's actually involved in validation? And how does that notion of validation relate to the validation project at the LSE? What does it mean to evaluate or to uh, uh, validate simulations? Um, when in the early stages of validation, back in 2003 and 2004, um, there was very little data that you could use to validate these simulations. So, and the, the, valid, the, the physics uh, validation project is an ongoing thing as long as the LHC is operating. So it, it's a very important feature of the, the overall experimental context. Um, well, here are just some of the sort of classic references from uh, uh, verification and validation, and here you can see it's uh, been mostly, uh, the methodology's mostly been developed by people in computational fluid dynamics, but uh, also people uh, working in the propulsion lab, jet propulsion lab, and uh, modeling storm surges, surges and uh, various other sorts of uh, things that have an impact on, uh, on engineering and, and technology generally. Um, okay, so the first um, question that, or the first issue that's, when you look at some of the papers from the validation project at uh, LHC, people don't talk a lot about verification, the fo the, the, they mostly focus on, on validation. Um, but the, the methodology really draws a sharp line between the two, and the verification is really the question of whether or not the computational model actually or accurately reflects the mathematical model and its solution. So um, have we lost something in the discretization process? Um, and it's a mathematical question. Have the, have the equations been solved correctly? Um, and here, um, the methodology really involves going through a lot of different types of verification. There's code verification, where you're looking at errors in the algorithms, um, different kinds of truncation errors, and um, solution verification, where you're looking at both the accuracy of the, of the input data and the accuracy of the output data. So estimating numerical solution errors, um, estimating um, sampling errors, and um, probably one of the most difficult ones to do is a discretization error, and these estimators usually rely on, on values from, from previous numerical models or numerical solutions, and very often there is no real sense of whether the error is small enough, depending on what you need the model to do. So it's a very kind of uh, the idea of, of uh, solution verification um, is something that doesn't involve any kind of proof, but rather it's uh, more concerned with stability and consistency and robustness of the numerical scheme. So it's not an exact science, even though it sounds verification, it sounds like it's some kind of establishing a mathematical proof. It's really a, a sort of um, set of procedures to try and establish the, the robustness of the numerical scheme. Then there's validation, and typically validation is supposed to come after verification, so unless you know that your numerical algorithms are, are good, um, there's no point in, in moving to the validation stage. The validation stage is a, it involves a physical question. Have the correct equations been solved? Not have the equations been solved correctly, but have the correct equations been solved? Um, and that's really about determining the degree to which the, the, the model accurately, accurately represents the target system, or the simulation results agree with, with uh, the uh, experimental data. So the question then is, how is that determined? Um, and again, here in, in, the, in, uh, the com in computational fluid dynamics, it's a very uh, intricate process involving uh, a, a validation experiments, a validation hierarchy. You start at the very low levels, the very, very low sort of uh, very simple physics models. Uh, you try and validate those, and then you move your way, move up to more sophisticated uh, levels where you've got more interaction with the models interacting with each other more. Um, and then um, there's uh, also what's called a validation metric, 
um, and the validation metric is a way of trying to establish um, a, a distance measure between the simulation output and the experimental data. So a lot of the people that work in this field don't like using p-values, don't like using frequencies, don't like using Bayesian analysis. So they want to measure some kind of, have some kind of independent distance measurement. It's usually a, maybe a, a probability, it can be a probability measure, but the, the idea is that the methodology is not one of statistical testing or, or Bayesian analysis. Again, the idea here is that the, the validation experiments have to be very, very strictly um, designed so that um, all of the, the, the parameters in the experiment have to be very strictly related to code calculations in the specific domain. And the idea is you don't compare the, valid, the simulation with pre-existing experimental results because very often the parameters in the experiment that, that you are comparing with may not have been um, uh, uh, accurately checked, there may be lots of noise factors that weren't important for the specific experiment that was being done, but become very important when you're comparing those results with a simulation output. Um, so all of these input parameters then have to be specified exactly. It, geometry, uncertainties in measurement accuracies, um, and uh, all of the components, all of the parameters that um, are related to the, the code calculations. Um, okay, that's not so important. Um, as I said, so then once the validation experiment is done, it's, it's compared with the simulation data through what's called this validation metric. Um, and it's really just a difference operator. And But the important thing is that it has to be, you have to have a, a very specifically quantified uh, measure of the errors and uncertainty both in the simulation data and in the experimental data. Now, that type of validation as it's described there um, is just not possible at the LHC, right? Because um, you have a, a hierarchy, you can have a, a hierarchy of validation. Um, but the validation, the large-scale validation needs to take place before any real jets are produced. And the problem is finding data that are going to be relevant for the comparison to the simulation. So you, it's, it's not feasible to have independent validation experiments against which to test the, the validation. So the question then is, um, how good are these uh, simulations, given that the validation, the sort of val validation procedures described by the methodology can't really be carried out? Um, well, what needs to be validated? Does, does everything need to be validated? Um, many things do, is the answer. Um, the, the shower packages have to be validated. Um, electromagnetic processes have to be validated. The usability of the environment, um, Monte Carlo truth, CPU, memory. Um, because what you need to ensure is that inadequate simulation models are not going to be the thing that's going to lead to uh, large systematic uh, contributions to the physics. So the dominant error shouldn't be because of some kind of simulation that's imperfect. So essentially, the, the two approaches to dealing with validation are the uh, comparisons with test beam data. Um, and that's usually bit data that's been collected by the uh, calorimeter modules or, or prototypes. And those um, are used for validating certain kinds of things like shower um, uh, features. And also benchmark studies, so uh, validation that compare, that's compared with uh, experiments for uh, at Los Alamos or, or Tevatron, um, and those provide tests of microscopic collisions. Um, any of the test beam data, um, 
has to be uh, looked at very carefully for beam contamination, electronic noise, all of that needs to be quantified and, and fully understood. Again, then, there's the problem of free parameters contained in the underlying physics. Um, and you need to do a lot of tweaking of, of generator codes to, uh, in order to describe the experimental data, um, problems with phenomenological models and free parameters because there's no well-developed underlying theory. And so you need to do a lot of tuning. And we also saw this morning um, some discussion of Rivet, which is a, a library of experimental analysis for tuning. And um, then there's another method um, uh, for uh, looking at um, how to, to, to do a good tune. Um, and the, there's another program for that called Professor, which parameterizes a fit function with a polynomial, and then you take the results of that and go back to Rivet and, and sort of uh, look at the, the quality of the tune. Um, so there are lots, as I said, lots of different levels of validation, but no specific, specifically designed validation experiments. Um, so the, the relationship then between the the data and the simulation um, really involves feedback for improved algorithms in the code and guidance to the experimental uh, 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 choice or the choice of what sorts of models to use, what are the best models, uh, what are the best physics models for the needs of the experiment. So validation then, instead of being a completely separate thing, in the way it's described in the, um, the CFD methodology, becomes a sort of feedback tool for code verification um, and also for theoretical model choice. So it doesn't function in this kind of independent way as it was originally formulated. Um, tuning is also required because of, of lack of fundamental theory for some of the processes. Um, so what the validation does really is tell you that there's certain features of the simulation package that are reliable and can be trusted not to produce systematic error. So the whole procedure of verification and validation as it was originally conceived was to completely get away from this idea of tuning. Um, and that was why the, 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 the people who developed the methodology um, also don't like um, Bayesian analysis because they see Bayesian analysis as, as too associated with, um, with tuning, with model tuning, and so the idea here is you just define a distance function and you just do these blind comparisons between experiment, experimental data and simulation data. But again, of course, this is impossible here. Um, and so then in cases where a validation isn't really feasible, you have to do calibration um, and you have to adjust the physical or numerical modeling parameters to improve agreement with data and then Rivet and Professor become important in, in this kind of uh, procedure. So um, unlike uh, other uses of validation and validation experiment, here the validation at the LHC really becomes more like a sort of second order experiment that then is, provides information to further refine the experimental setup, um, further refine the codes and algorithms, and choose the right sorts of models for the, for the physics that you're interested in. So simulation and validation become a, are, are a very integral part of the experiment and they function as a kind of integrated unit almost. Um, so, the change, so this changes the nature of validation very significantly to something that's carried out separately to something that involves a process of tuning and calibration and backwards and forwards. Um, but given the nature of the experiment, it's really difficult to see how any other kind of validation process is going to be possible. So. Um, Conclusions then, um, 
the validation at the LHC is really too complex to fit into the traditional um, methodology. It's a restricted notion of validation that's necessitated by, the, first of all, the enormous amount of data and also the type of data that's required by the experiments. Um, so in that sense, the experimental conditions and the really large amounts of data that are being dealt with here um, make it necessary to completely reconfigure or redefine almost the, uh, the validation process. In the case of the financial markets, also the bigness of the data and the character of, these, of the data in these large markets ushered in a completely new kind of methodology to deal with markets and market data and, and in a sense kind of redefined what our concept of a market actually looked like. So we get this sort of transformation of the methodology for dealing with data that is that originates really in the kind and size of the data itself. So the methodological changes become necessary given the kind of data and the amount of data that you're actually dealing with. So, so it raises a, some epistemological questions um, in that the nature of the data is actually determining the, the methodological constraints and we're redefining the way in which the methodology works in order to account for the sorts of situations that, um, that we're faced with or that we need to, uh, to deal with. Um, so it, what it seems like is an, an inevitable result of not just using big data to, to describe certain kinds of systems, but also the kinds of systems that we're dealing with. So the kind of investigations that's going on, that are going on at the LHC just render um, render the, no, the, the other kind of verification and validation procedures virtually impossible. So the question then is, as a, as a sort of philosophical conclusion, is should we be worried about this? Um, or is this just inevitable? And if we are worried about it, if we, if we do worry about the, the sort of validation processes that we think are being used to validate the simulations, what, what could be done about it? Um, because it's not clear that um, you can actually talk meaningfully about a process like verification and validation as it's conceived of in, um, in fluid dynamics where you've got well-developed theories um, and transport that into another domain where you've got very different kinds of investigations. So should those crossovers, um, what should we worry about um, changing the nature of validation and what that does to our faith in, in, um, in certain kinds of experimental outcomes. That's a question for the physicists in the audience. Thank you.